the wheel of old Ironsides, the Constitution, one of the great warships of our history, 204 feet long, built of oak and red sea, carried 52 guns, capable of shooting 32-pound carronades. She was built in 1797 for use in Mediterranean waters to fight the Barbary pirates and helped our small nation of 16 states to survive. This is the wheel of the USS Forrestal. She and her sister ship, the Saratoga, are the world's largest aircraft carriers. Built of steel and tungsten, she can carry over 100 jet aircraft and atomic and hydrogen bombs. She was built for use all over the world so that this nation and this planet might survive. The Forrestal is likely in or en route to the Mediterranean right now. There is currently a revolution in the Navy, a revolution in ships, in weapons, and in men. A revolution which really began in 1939, when Professor Einstein wrote a letter to the President of the United States about a new kind of bomb, which he predicted would be carried by boats and would be capable of enormous destruction. But even Mr. Einstein did not prophesy that the boat, as he put it, that delivered the bomb would be powered by the very energy of the atom which his equation unleashed. See It Now presents a full hour report on revolution in the Navy, much of which originates on the atomic submarine Nautilus and the aircraft carrier Forrestal and includes interviews with Admiral Arlie Burke and Admiral Hyman Rickover. This is the bridge of the Nautilus, the world's first nuclear-powered vessel. See It Now is attempting to do a report on the new Navy, on the revolution that has occurred as a result of the introduction of nuclear power and nuclear weapons. We're traveling on reactor power now. The Nautilus is exactly 319 feet long, cost about $50 million, about 100 officers and sailors aboard. And this is Captain Wilkinson, the skipper. Captain, you've had the Nautilus uh, from the very beginning, haven't you? Uh, yes, since she went in commission in September 54. And um, how long have you been in the Navy? Nearly 16 years. Uh, how long does it take to dive the Nautilus? As an average, uh, from 40 to 50 seconds. Well, sir, we're going to spend the next three or four days here with you, uh, and you've been good enough to say you'd show us how the Nautilus dives and surfaces and how the men who live and work on this incredible piece of hardware go about doing their business. So I know you're planning to dive now, and so I'll get out from underfoot and get down, and you can get about your business. Thank you. The bow planes, which control the depth of the dive, are spread. Dive. The submarine starts diving before all the hatches are secured. All that down. As the boat starts down, the officer of the deck and the two lookouts secure the bridge access hatch and swiftly take their positions in the diving control room. The two lookouts occupy these two seats here. There's the first one now. There comes the second one. The one on the right takes the bow planes here, and the man over on the left takes the helm. Straight board. Five, five feet. Five, five feet. Five, five feet. Five, five feet five down. Five down. All ahead, two thirds. All ahead, two thirds. All right, so all ahead, two thirds. Very well. Blow negative. Blow negative, right? Blow negative. All right. 
One down. One down. Air secured a negative. Very well. Negative flat shut, all vents shut. Very well, cycle events. Cycle events, sir. One down. Very well. I am now about a med ship on the Nautilus, surrounded by a veritable forest of dials, gauges, levers. One has the feeling of being afraid to touch anything here. And through that door is the thing that makes the Nautilus different from any other submarine. And the sign over the door merely says door BHD 45 to reactor room. And through that door, no unauthorized personnel is allowed to pass. The Nautilus dives as much as 15 or 20 times a day, is constantly undergoing maneuvers, all of them too classified and too complicated to explain or even understand. But here, for just a few minutes, is Commander Wilkinson in the attack center of the atomic submarine, taking his team through a combat problem. Make your depth eight zero feet. Make depth eight zero feet, I. Eight zero feet. Eight Four down. Feet, I. Four down. Man your battle station torpedo. Man your battle station torpedo. Pull it out. Okay, take the straps off. Look out here. Watch your head. Ease your bubble. Ease your bubble, aye. Sounding. Seven fathoms. Sounding seven fathoms, aye. One down. One down. Sounding. Sounding, aye. Six and a half fathoms. Sounding six and a half fathoms, eight oh feet, sir. Aye. What do you have? Uh, here they all are. Uh, 174, 162, 180, and 176. Turn count of 105. Which is the big one? Uh, one at 176. Track target at 176. Track target at 176. Does sonar 2 have any? Yes, sonar 2 have Please target turn 4. Bearing 168. What is the distance to the track? Distance to the track, 9 double O yards. Right full rudder, all ahead 2 thirds, steady on 0 9 0. Right full rudder, all ahead 2 thirds, steady on 0 9 0. Open the outer doors. Board room. Open the outer doors. Open outer doors. Open outer doors. Tube ready. Bearing 186. Come back in again, I. 185. Torpedo run 1400. We have a track in solution, Captain. Final sonar bearing and shoot. Shoot! Fire three. Fire four. All tubes fired electrically, tubes secured. Aye. All tubes fired electrically, all tubes secured, sir. There is no claustrophobia here. No sense of being deprived of daylight. No feeling of night or day. And the only way you can tell whether you are submerged or not is that the sea is motionless down here. The galley is open 24 hours a day. Control, con, blow bow buoyancy. Blow bow buoyancy, aye. Blow bow buoyancy. Blow bow buoyancy. Blowing bow buoyancy. The only time you have a sensation of maneuvering or even depth on the Nautilus is at the time of surfacing. Everything on the boat suddenly seems to become aware of the law of gravity. <laughs> Group. Blow the forward group. Blow the forward group. Blow your forward group. Blow rise, both planes. Blow rise, Blow the after group. Blow the after group. Blow the after group. Five. And now she's going up. It's rather like uh, a glider or going uphill on a toboggan. A huge surfboard. Hold your angle. We call this program Revolution in the Navy, not only because of the revolution that the atom and the new weapons have brought about, 
but because of the attack and bold vision of some of the men who now run the Navy. Admiral Arleigh, 31 knot Burke, was jumped 92 notches to become Chief of Naval Operations. Hyman Rickover was an obscure captain who fought a war against lethargy and barnacle tradition to get the Nautilus onto the drawing board and into operation. He was finally made a rear admiral by presidential and congressional action after two Navy selection boards passed him over. As revolutionary as is the Nautilus, the atomic submarine of the future will probably resemble it only in its nuclear power plant. The shape of the present submarine, designed to operate a good deal of the time on the surface, is on the way out. Submarines of the future will be true submersibles, designed to operate underwater 99% of the time, and will be shaped like a streamlined whale. An experimental submarine of this new design, the Albacore, is now being operated out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and the keel for an atomic submarine of this type has already been laid. This is a Navy picket boat. It is traveling at twice the speed of the fastest World War II submarines. The Albacore's speed, like that of the Nautilus, is highly classified. The Navy says only that it exceeds 20 knots. There he is. Mark, bring me up about a foot. About a foot, eh? As you watch the Albacore's periscope overtake the picket boat, you may get some idea of the speed of the atomic submarines of the future. Lieutenant Commander John L. Boys, the commanding officer of the USS Albacore. The Albacore has been a dream of man for more than 400 years because she flies underwater. She is the true submersible. And when the Nautilus nuclear heart goes into the Albacore form, man will never worry about coming to the surface to breathe and to look about. He will dive at the port and go into the deep blue. He will strike at the enemy, and then he shall return and surface once again at the entrance of the harbor from whence he came. Admiral Rickover and Commander Wilkinson spoke of atomic-driven submarines capable of carrying guided missiles. This submarine, in Atlantic waters, is the Barbero, driven by a conventional diesel power plant. The Barbero surfaces in less than a minute. The Barbero is equipped to launch the Regulus, a guided missile with accurate control up to 500 miles. The Regulus could have an atomic or hydrogen warhead on it. This one has neither. It will be aimed by instruments and guided during flights by radar. The missile Regulus can also be launched from surface ships and land bases, presumably at a city or a base of strategic importance. The Air Force has a similar missile that it launches from bases in Libya called the Matador. In less than two minutes, a hydraulic lift moves the launching platform into position on the deck.
A JATO unit launches the Regulus at a takeoff speed of 225 miles per hour. As for the submarine, the instant the missile is launched, the Barbero begins to dive. Even before the rocket smoke is cleared away, this disappearing airfield will be several hundred feet underwater. Were it the Nautilus or the Sea Wolf, it would not have to surface again until it got back to its home port. A fleet of three or four hundred atomic submarines equipped with missiles, armed with atomic or hydrogen warheads, and strategically located all over the world, could provide a series of invisible airfields capable of striking anywhere on Earth. A sobering thought for any enemy of the United States, but equally sobering for us in a civilization where nature and science have few secrets. Because these missiles cost the Navy several hundred thousand dollars, they are seldom permitted to land on targets and explode. And immediately after launching, a manned jet escort picks up the Regulus and stays with it all the way back to home base, where it is landed by instruments, a pilotless weapon capable of total destruction. to believe that our stride in guided missiles or atomic weapons is exclusive. And there is definite reason to believe that the Russians are ahead of us in a number of operational submarines. If they do not already have an atomic submarine, it is certainly only a matter of time until they do. But in its scientific battles, as in its sea encounters, the Navy loses an occasional round. The Seamaster, the world's first jet sea bomber in the class of the Air Force's B-47, designed to fly at more than 600 miles an hour and designed for long-range bombing and to be used in concert with atomic submarines, crashed less than 10 days ago. The Navy expects to have another one flying by spring. The Sea Wolf, the Navy's second atomic submarine, has also had its troubles. It has been reported that its reactor, which uses liquid sodium, has operational difficulties and might eventually have to be replaced with a reactor similar to that of the Nautilus, which uses pressurized water instead of sodium. See it now's report on the Navy continues from the aircraft carrier Forrestal and the missile launching cruiser Boston. This is the aircraft carrier Forrestal, named in honor of America's first Secretary of Defense. Length, a fifth of a mile. 60,000 tons, or twice the weight of the old Lex, the fighting lady of World War II. Five times the length of old Ironside. Breadth at main deck, 129 feet. Angle deck gives it the equivalent of two runways. Height from keel to mast top equals that of a 25-story office building. Number of crew, 3,500. Speed, Anything more than 30 knots classified. Completely air conditioned. Its hangar deck resembles the assembly line at Willow Run. Has storage and complete maintenance facilities for the F-3H jet fighter and the A-3D jet bomber and the new F-8U Crusader. The size of this steel cavern so dwarfs the planes that it's easy to forget that these jet bombers weigh 60,000 pounds or half the weight of a B-29. Ready one there, Ops. Four elevators shuttle the planes up to the flight deck in a matter of seconds. Okay, let's go. The pilots, who live and are briefed far below the flight deck, are shuttled up from the ready room by way of two electric escalators. The modern jet pilot wears so much heavy equipment today that if he were to run up to the flight deck, he might not be at his best to fly the mission. In spite of the massive length of the forestall, these jets are assisted into the air by a steam catapult. The blast of the jet's afterburner is so hot to protect personnel and equipment on the deck.
The jets land at close to 150 miles an hour and come to a stop in a matter of feet with the help of powerful arresting gear. A new device on the Forestall is called the meatball, a mirror arrangement which reflects the plane's landing course and helps bring them in. The Navy's F-8U Crusader has recently been added to the fighting strength of the Forestall. The Crusader is the Navy's fastest jet fighter capable of speeds in excess of a thousand miles an hour. This is in a class with the Air Force's land-based F-104. But as the Navy pilots ruefully point out, the Air Force has slightly more space to land on. On the flag bridge of the Saratoga, we talked with Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Arleigh Burke, about the capabilities of the Saratoga and the Forestall. Well, now, Admiral Burke, where do these huge carriers fit into this picture, both offensively and defensively? Oh, I know that's a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> well, these carriers are the backbone of naval power. They, uh, th this is probably the best war machine that has ever been built by mankind. It has a terrific power. Primarily, these carriers are offensive weapons. There are two things, of course, that a Navy must do, that we must do particularly. Uh, we must be able to carry the war to the enemy, to project our total military power across the sea. We want to fight in the enemy's territory. We don't want to fight over here. And the other thing that we must do is to be able to protect our merchantmen, which carries all the supplies and things to our deployed forces overseas and to our allies overseas. If we, we are ever unable to control the seas, we're going to fight in this country. We're going to defend this country and this country alone. We're going to be, all the rest of the world will be anti-United States. They will be, either be enemies or they'll be neutralists against us. The United States Navy is the only Navy in the whole world that has the ability to control the high seas now. The Russian Navy is the second Navy in the world and it is designed to deny us control of the seas near Eurasia. Now these carriers uh, are the backbone. They are big, it's true, but they are big because of modern aircraft that we have to have in order to compete with the modern aircraft that the enemy has are big airplanes, they're heavy, they have high speeds, and so it's, this is a minimum size carrier that will operate these modern aircraft. Well, sir, just how vulnerable are huge carriers like this to modern nuclear weapons? In other words, uh, uh, where does it stand now in terms of defense and offense, which is always swinging? Well, it is always swinging. There's always uh, balance and counterbalance. Peculiar as it may sound, the advent of atomic weapons has increased the relative power of carriers and increased our defensive characteristics. I'd like to explain uh, that a little bit. Please do. <laughs> because it sounds... It sounds uh, Sort of a, it sounded like a paradox, and that is. Uh, uh, for example, a nuclear bomb, a nuclear bomb will uh, dropped on a carrier, will destroy it. But it will also completely destroy any land base, wipe it out. You can't do anything with it. Now, a near miss, by, uh, that is a miss that will make, that will create great destruction on a land base, well, thank you, sir, will not, uh, will not, do equal damage to this carrier, or two carriers. You notice that all of our people are all, always working all the time uh, below decks. Yeah. It's got good protection from blast, from heat, from radiation. The, by working in the sea, because we, go to, uh, we are at sea, we've got automatic uh, sprinkler systems and things like that that will carry off the, the atomic contamination. Also, this ship is strong. She's built for the rigors of the sea. And so uh, shock and things like that that will knock down a shore-based structure won't hurt this ship. In addition to that, there will be a lot of destroyers. And beyond those destroyers over the horizon, 40 or 50 miles perhaps, are picket ships, destroyers. And flying over the sea, or perhaps 100 miles out from this carrier, 
our anti-submarine aircraft launched from this particular task force. Now, any submarine that sticks its periscope up or comes anywhere near the surface is liable to be sighted right quickly, both by radar or visually. And he's in trouble right from then on. Part of the fleet that sets up a protective screen around the Forrestal and the Saratoga are guided missile cruisers. This is the Boston, originally equipped with eight-inch guns for traditional bombardment. Now the Boston is used for launching the Terrier, a surface-to-air missile designed to shoot down enemy aircraft attempting to get at our big carriers. Launcher control, load launchers. Launcher control, aye. When an alert is sounded, the Terrier missile is almost automatically moved up into the launcher. Launcher's loaded. Uh, stand by to fire. Sign uh, Launcher 2, Director 9. Launcher 2, you're assigned Director 9. Launcher 2, affirmative. The radar looks far out to sea and high into the sky, infinitely further than man or binoculars could see. The radar zeroes in on the attacking plane, checks its focus, corrects for windage and the curvature of the Earth. When it is convinced that it is on target, it locks itself on. Target in range, ready to fire. Stand by. Shoot! At a speed of 1,500 miles an hour, the Terrier is accurate up to a range of 10 to 20 miles. But the Navy is hopeful of greatly increasing this range. After the Terrier is launched, Radar continues to adjust and correct the flight. If the plane attempts to maneuver or hide in a cloud, or if the initial aim is off, the Terrier responds to new automatic signals and relentlessly hunts out its target. This target plane is a pilotless drone. So far, no pilot has been in the position of being pursued by the Terrier. Even if the most skilled pilot were to try evasive action, escape from this electronic hunter would be improbable, once the missile locked on target. The Navy has other missiles. The Sidewinder, which is an air-to-air -air missile, and the Talos, which is a surface-to-air missile, not unlike the Army's Nike. The Navy also has an intermediate-range ballistic missile currently testing in the 1,500-mile range, and expects to launch the satellite during the next year. radical new concepts in this new Navy. It has already been announced that an atomic depth charge is almost ready for anti-submarine work. It is likely there will soon be an announcement about atomic warheads on torpedoes. The satellite is soon to be tested. The missile horizon is constantly being extended, and the Marines' vertical envelopment plan is already beginning to operate. But despite these new and destructive devices with greater power and greater range, it remains a fact that if we are to fight anywhere other than on our own territory, then the men and material must be transported there, and that is the job of the Navy. It is also worth noting that in this present crisis, the Forrestal and the Saratoga, with their escorting vessels and their aircraft, are now somewhere at sea. The Navy calls this an exercise, but it is a demonstration of power, power in being and power in motion.